Hello everyone, welcome to Dynamics Con. I would like to thank all the people who have voted for the amazing sessions which are being uh, delivered in this event. I would also like to thank all the organizers and sponsors of Dynamics User Group who have created this platform for users and Dynamics 365 professionals across the globe to come together and share their knowledge. In this session, I will be talking about Solution Architect Toolkit for Dynamics 365 Finance and Operations Project. As you can see, I have a Batman as my title slide because I do believe Solution Architects are very much similar to superheroes. I'll quickly introduce myself. My name is Rachid Gurk and I'm based in Australia. I currently work with PwC as a senior manager in Microsoft Dynamics practice. You can see some QR codes, which are my handles on social media. So feel free to scan them and connect with me. I also work with a couple of other user groups, which are aiming to create platforms for Dynamics 365 professionals to connect and collaborate. As you can see on the screen, I'm part of ANZ Dynamics 365 FinOps team, which is focused on Dynamics professionals in Australia and New Zealand. I'm part of India user group as well as Pakistan user group. So we are getting uh, good uh, feedback and attention from people there. So I would encourage you to join these groups and help us drive these forward. From professional side, I have been working in Dynamics 365 implementation since year 2005. Uh, I've started working with Dynamics uh, AX. It was version 3.0 in 2005 and have seen this journey till the evergreen version of finance and operations. I am a community enthusiast and also a Microsoft certified trainer. So in the next 40 minutes, we will be uh, talking about the role of solution architect and various uh, strategy and documents which you can create during an implementation uh, journey, which will help you to ease the implementation. Please feel free to ask your questions in the Q&A chat window and we can cover them towards the end of the session. So we will start with what is the role of a solution architect in a Dynamics 365 implementation project. What you see on the screen is the solution architect is one of the key player who talks to three parties, the customer, Microsoft, and the actual project implementation team. Because these three are the major parties which work together to bring a project to a closure and to a successful implementation. Now with regards to customer solution architect, is mainly involved in activities like onboarding to Dynamics platform because customers are not too much educated about that platform when they start their journey. So the solution architect is one of their trusted advisor and the key person who guides them throughout this journey. He also provides thought leadership and recommendations based on his experience and by understanding the customer's current architectural landscape. A solution architect also becomes the first point of contact sometimes where you have to pass the critical phases of the project to the next level. A solution architect also is the key point of contact for Microsoft because for the Microsoft fast track architects, they need a point of contact with whom they can discuss about how the project is going. What are the key milestones coming up? Are there any risk areas? So solution architect is the person who represents the whole project to Microsoft fast track architects and plays a very crucial role in that engagement. Also to the project team, which is implementing the solution, solution architect is your uh, go-to person for any critical issues or any key design decisions. And as well as a solution architect provides leadership and mentoring to the team. He also works closely with project managers to do forward planning and call out any critical things which needs to be taken care of. So as you can see, solution architect plays a very key role and he is the trusted advisor for the major parties which are involved in any implementation project. So if you have started uh, doing the role of a solution architect in a Dynamics implementation, you have to take care of all these three parties. So let's go forward. Um, what we want to talk about is success by design. So success by design is a set of design principles which Microsoft has recently released. And these are design principles. So the key here is to understand that these principles can be applied to any implementation methodology. So if you are using waterfall or agile or a hybrid approach, these principles can still be applied. You don't really have to refactor your whole implementation strategy to apply these principles. And these success by design principles are based on the real experience of Microsoft architects across the globe. 
across the industries. So these principles, if taken care by the architects and if applied during the project in the implementation phase, adds a lot of value and removes a lot of road blockers. As you can see, success by design principles they span across various project implementation phases from onboarding till go live. At each phase, Microsoft has published what type of uh, designs consideration should be done and where which document should be prepared. So the checklist which I'm going to share today is actually also aligned with these principles. So we will be talking about solution blueprint review and the integration checklist. And we will see how it all fits into this success by design principles. If you Google, you will be able to download uh, around a 600 page PDF file, which is published by Microsoft, which covers all these phases and explains each phase in very detail. So if you are a solution architect or a project manager, I would highly encourage you to download this uh, success by design principle file and go through it. Let's move forward and we'll see what the toolkit components are. So what we are listing here are some uh, documents and checklist and templates which a solution architect should keep handy because these are required in every project and they can be asked anytime during the project. So the key documents, this is again, this is not a complete list, but these are some of the key documents which are required in every project. The key Documents are the solution blueprint document, environment planning document, data migration strategy, integration catalog. And then there is a understanding of LCS tools and processes and the wider dynamics ecosystem, which is required for solution architects to be aware of. So let's uh, talk about solution blueprint document. What this document is, it's basically a document which is prepared towards the end of your design phase, which captures some key objectives which are mentioned on the screen at the moment. So executive summary is the section where you summarize the key findings of the design phase. It is meant for the project sponsors, so they won't probably go to very line level detail of what type of integration patterns were used, but they will like to understand what is the project objective, how your solution is fulfilling the vision, and what are the key design considerations. Then you go on with elaboration of your project objectives, various project phases, what is your solution overview where you can talk about which dynamics applications are, be, are part of the solution and what are the other uh, integration layers, uh, for example. Then we talk about instance strategy because this is, this is an important thing because it can add a lot of cost to your project if you don't decide it in advance. For example, do you need a dedicated data migration environment or a data or a dedicated performance testing environment. So a high level view of instance strategy adds a lot of value in the solution blueprint document. It also helps to identify what will be the key cost uh, or the cost of hosting all the environments throughout the phase. Organization structure is a, a component where you define how many legal entities will be configured in Dynamics 365, how will they be consolidated and which legal entities will be the consolidation companies. And this is important. This will help companies to realize how their uh, company structure is being reflected in Dynamics 365. Business process catalog is a high level uh, catalog of which business processes are being covered by Dynamics 365 application and uh, which will be uh, actioned in this particular project. Now, this doesn't has to be a very long list of all the business processes, but it could be something like level two of the business processes. We can have a detailed solution architecture document or a business process catalog or a guide where which we can reference in a blueprint document. So this document generally is around, in my experience, 40 to 50 page document. Some companies also make a, P, uh, a PPT file, uh, which is easy to read. But the objective is to cover all these key areas uh, on a summarized way so that anyone who reads this document gets a view of how these things are being catered. Key design decisions are the decisions which, if changed, can have a bigger impact on the project implementation. It could be things like uh, how many tenants are used in the implementation. Some companies use a non-production tenant. So if this decision changes uh, during any phase of the implementation, it can have a big impact. Another example could be if you are going to use product variants 
or if we are going to use advanced warehousing. So these type of things, if decided early and logged, should be captured in a blueprint document. Integration design, data migration design, all these are key components which we will cover uh, in our upcoming slides. Few tips to keep uh, to have your solution blueprint document uh, nice is that keep it short because we are covering too many things in one document uh, don't elaborate to a very you know detailed level for everything you can have a separate document to detail out your for example testing strategy capture your key design decisions capture your solution assumptions because if these change in the long run then your solution is impacted stick to the objective of the document this is not a, a, a statement of work or a a detailed architecture document it's a solution blueprint document and keep revisiting it and engage it with your microsoft fast track architects as a part of success by design microsoft also conducts a solution blueprint review exercise and if you consider all these components in your solution uh, in your blueprint document then the review exercise will be more smooth Let's talk a bit about environment planning. Environment planning is very important because it starts from the beginning of the project and it is a discussion which happens at every stage of the project because it, it involves cost and it also involves strategy. So when you start with environment planning during the early phases, talk about the talent strategy because what I have seen is some companies, uh, they do realize towards the end of the project, just before going live, that we need a non-production talent due to some X, Y, Z reason. So talk about your talent strategies. Uh, talk about what default environments you get when you buy a Dynamics 365 subscription and what type of capacities are part of that subscription. So for example, you get some default capacity of Dataverse or Power Platform or, or what type of Azure storage capacities you get. You should have that clarity. And then you plan how many additional environments you need uh, further down the line. So for example, uh, after your development phase, you might need to have a system integration testing and a user acceptance testing environment running in parallel. So you might need an additional environments there. However, you may not need them from the beginning of the project. So you may need them towards the end of the project. So all these things flow into the environment planning consideration. What is your post go live environment planning? Because that's when you need an environment to service the production environment. So these things needs to be captured in your environment planning document. How do you move code and data across the environment? What will be your uh, flow of uh, your code and packages? And how are you going to build the code which the developers are writing? So these are some of the key environment planning considerations. What we see on the screen is how uh, the application lifecycle works because this, these things are defined in detail by the technology lead or the technology architect. But a solution architect should be aware of the concepts. So the concepts here are that every developer work on their own developer machine and they check in the code to Azure DevOps. And then the Azure DevOps is your central repository for all the code which you have written for extending the standard functionality. All the source code then gets built by a build agent or a build machine. There are two options around that. And the result of the build is a deployable package which gets stored in lifecycle services as a shared asset. Now from the lifecycle services, we can deploy these packages to the testing environments. And once the package has been tested, you can mark it as a release candidate and then you can deploy it in the production environment. So a solution architect should be aware of this flow and every project can have some variance to this, but uh, that will be more of a technology and a technical architect's decisions. But as a solution architect, you should be aware of how the code and code flows and how the DevOps and lifecycle services are used. A quick comparison of different type of environments which are available. So we have tier one and tier two environments when we talk about Dynamics 365 finance and operations. So Dynamics 365 finance and operations is very different to customer engagement and other applications. It is not built on Dataverse. It has its own SQL Azure database, which is which comes as a part of tier two and above environment. Tier one environments are mostly used for development purposes. And tier two and above are used for testing, data migration, and integration purposes. Tier one environments are basically single box, where that means your database, your 
application object server they all are installed on the same machine and there are two options to host tier one environments you can either host in your own azure subscription as pay as you go uh, model or you can download local vhds now there is a, a comparison between what is the pro and con between downloading a local vhd versus hosting it on cloud uh, which your which you can discuss with your customer depending on their current infrastructure uh, what they prefer to choose but uh, mostly i have seen that customers use a cloud hosted machine because it is publicly available it, it can be shared by consultants using a url and they can log in and test and you can easily build integrations on a cloud hosted vm so you do get some benefits when your development machines are hosted on cloud tier 2 and above are basically hosted in microsoft subscription that means you pay a fixed price you don't pay as you go so that's with the tier 1 of tier 1 machines tier 2 machines are a bit costly so it becomes important to plan them in advance because it also takes some time for microsoft to provision them into your lcs instance now when it comes to building the code which developers have written there are two options either you can host your own cloud vm which is a tier 1 machine which is a dedicated VM, which you pay as you go. Or you can use Azure hosted build agents, which is a new serverless way of building code. Uh, the only caveat is that in Azure hosted agents, you can only build X++ code and you cannot run your sys test uh, unit tests, which are written by developers. Uh, if that's not a problem, then uh, it's recommended for companies to go on Azure hosted agents. So why I'm talking this for a solution architect is that they should understand the differences discuss it with their technology architect and the customer and decide what's best for their project what we present what i'm presenting on the screen is a sample environment plan which you should prepare from the beginning of the project and it can be a living document throughout your project where you can talk about what will be the environment naming convention what will be the purpose of the environment where the environment will be deployed what will be the topology and who manages it and how the licensing will be maintained as well as when the environment will be ready. So this is important because if you need an environment which you need on week 16, then it's not wise to start paying for that environment during the early phases of the project. So plan your environments in a way that you know when you need that environment and you start hosting them accordingly. Data migration strategy is where uh, is very important aspect. According to me, it's one of the most critical part of every implementation project. And it's not only about migrating data, it is about what you need to migrate, from which system you need to migrate and how you will migrate. So there are a lot of aspects in data migration. How will you extract the data, translate the data and load it into the system? Mostly what I have seen is that there is a de dedicated data migration team in big projects, but if the project is a small or medium size, then there may this responsibility is being uh, divided in the team and the architects and consultants and technical people, they work together to load this data. Uh, the, but the approach, the tools and the preparation is very important. Uh, there are a few things which uh, I would like to show with regards to data migration, which are uh, which can be leveraged uh, so i just want to first talk about that data migration is not a, a phase which happens towards the end of the project it is a it is an activity which happens throughout the project implementation from initiation of the project till you go live data migration is a continuous thing because you start planning you start designing you start doing some testing and it's an iterative approach you it's very unlikely that you will be successfully be able to load all the data in one go it requires a bit of iteration and um, refinement in the process so there are some uh, tools which are used published by microsoft i'll quickly show you uh, data migration uh, templates which are published by microsoft because what i have seen is in most of the cases people end up managing each and every data entity of finance and operations whereas uh, microsoft has published a uh, data templates which groups your data entities by business area so if you go to your uh, data management workspace we'll quickly go there guys if you have any questions feel free to pop them in the chat window we will take them towards the end um, so when you come to data management workspace and go to templates here you can see that there are some 
templates which is having which has lot of entities grouped by the area so if you see system setup all these entities are part of a system setup which probably you may not be even migrating data from external system this is something you might be configuring but once you configure you might want to export all this data and load it into another environment so the good thing about these templates is that you can group multiple entities into one template and then create a data project out of it and export it in one go what microsoft has done is they have published default templates per module so if you see there is a long list of modules and data templates which microsoft has published if you want to start configuring data migration of a particular module use the default templates as the starting point because this gives you a ready to use structure where the entities are sequenced so if i just added budgeting and here i can see what are the data entities which are in budget in which sequence they should be imported and microsoft has predefined their execution level so these data entities can run in parallel based on the setting of these fields and this improves your data load performance these templates can also be modified so you if you are building your own data entities for some extensions you can add those entities in these templates so use these templates as the starting point also there is a very good blog by one of the architects from microsoft who has talked about the tips and tricks to improve the performance of data migration so these are uh, some configurations which we can do in the finance and operation applications which will help you to improve the data load performance so it's highly recommended for solution architects to look into these blogs and leverage the data templates as a starting point for your data migration another key thing uh, when preparing your data migration uh, worksheets is that try to group the data uh, by business area and then also try to identify which entities are shared across legal entities versus which entities are data entities are uh, legal entity specific also identify your high volume uh, data loads so that you can fine tune the parameter settings for those there is also a, a particular type of data which is used for just for configuration purposes so that's something you don't extract and transform but once you define the configuration in system you you may need to control it and govern it so for that use data templates create a data template and export it and use that data template to import the data in another environment this is one of the pain points in a lot of implementations that uh, the the partners or the uh, the implementation team is not sure how the data is synchronized or is it correct so the best way is to use a data template put all the entities export it from the config environment and import it in the other environments so these are some key considerations for data migrations um, we'll talk about integration planning uh, here we will talk about what you should consider from integration strategy perspective again talking about patterns how do you handle errors that all thing can be done with your technical team but as a solution architect you should have a integration strategy document which talks about what is the current landscape of your customer what are the platforms which you are leveraging to build your end to end integration strategy what are the different patterns which are supported through those uh, applications what will be the middleware and what are your target systems and source systems so in case dynamics is sending data out or dynamics is receiving from data then what are those systems which are which will be talking to dynamics and what will be the business processes impacted so these are some key things which you should keep in mind while defining your integration strategy now with the evolution and with the maturity in power platform and data lake and the uh, data verse we do also have to consider if you are integrating dynamics 365 ce with dynamics 365 finance and operations then probably look at using tools like data integrator or dual right so these things can also be leveraged instead of building your integrations a sample of integration catalog may look like this where you define each integration with a unique number so that if you are talking or discussing about a particular integration you can always have a unique reference number for that integration then you can have source source system target system what is the middleware brief about the business scenario which is being catered by the integration what is the expected volume and what is the expected frequency because these will help you to determine the pattern 
and then you can have a detailed integration design document which for which you can store a link in your catalog and then you can have a complexity of how much is how complex is that integration so if you have this view as a solution architect you will always uh, have a uh, good information handy in case you are talking to microsoft or to customer or to your own team and you can also use it to track the progress and uh, other things so it's highly recommended to have an integration catalog again it can't be built in one day but you need to start defining the structure from the beginning of the project and keep revisiting it and keep maturing it as you progress throughout the project few things around lcs is that uh, lcs as most of the uh, people know is a cloud portal for managing your dynamics environment but apart from just managing environment you can manage your teams you can define your project milestones you can do your database refreshes from lcs and you can also raise some support ticket with microsoft one very important thing in lcs is to update the one version settings so the way your service and service updates gets applied to tier 2 environment is through the uh, lcs settings so you need to make sure that your environments which you have specified for automatic updates are correct and um, the time zone is also correct for applying those updates uh, a quick snapshot of what type of database movements you can do in lcs you can export database import database you can do a point in time restore so point in time restore is again restoring database it won't restore your application version uh, so that has to be considered and you can also uh, do a conversion to refresh your tier one machines from your tier two environment so that's the steps we have shown here um, so this is a screenshot of how you can update your uh, settings for which environment you can select you can select a tier two environment and then you can select when you want to uh, apply the update there are various roles in lcs where you can define when you add a person what access he will get so it's important to understand you when you add more users to LCS that they are having the right role to the uh, portal and it's recommended to have a service account uh, which can be used for deployments and which can be used as an administrator for LCS. Training is a key aspect uh, in every project but again uh, it's not something which has to be left towards the end. It starts from the beginning and it has a lot of things to go through. So when you create a training plan and when you do the trainings you make sure that you identify your super users and your trainers whom you as a partner can train and you keep engaging them throughout the journey because if you just uh, you know go for training towards the end of the project it becomes a big piece of work so engage with your trainers early on in the project and keep getting their feedback because ultimately we are building and implementing projects for end users right so make sure that the training part is taken care since the beginning of the project till the end of the go live testing strategy is where you define what you want to test how you will test and what is the expected outcome it's not easy to define it requires an understanding of all the business processes and which tools you are using to test so for example of a test case is uh, if you define you at least capture these things so this is from the success by design example where you say which process i am testing what was the requirement what is the prerequisites for this process what is the test case number what are the steps what is the test data what is the expected result so if you define test case make sure that you have all these things getting covered because if things are not working and you are taking it for troubleshooting these things are required and having this handy will improve your overall text execution strategy testing is also throughout the project in different phases you do different type of testing so during the implementation and the build phase you do unit testing functional testing but there are some testing which are across multiple phases and there is a regression testing which remains all throughout so for regression testing microsoft recommends to use regression suite automation testing tool uh, it takes time to configure it but if you start early by the time you go live you have a good set of test cases ready and then you can automate using your devops pipeline so regression testing efforts can be reduced in long run if you start investing in our set early on so that's a key tip here to make sure your regression testing is smooth there are some other considerations uh, things like uh, Azure Data Lake. So Azure Data Lake has matured a lot and Microsoft has also released a, a pipeline to publish Dynamics data in Data Factory. And from Azure Data Factory, you can build your own models and analytics by using tools like Azure Synapse and Azure Databricks. And then you can build your own Power BI 
charts where you can show the analytics where people can respond and act upon and then you can embed these power bi dashboards in dynamics 365 finance and operations so when you are building working towards building analytics and power bi try to leverage the modern technology and don't just try to do everything within dynamics there are things like uh, <clears throat> entity store within dynamics where you can build your own aggregates but if you have a good analytics practice i think it's better to use data factory and azure synapse to do the analytics on dynamics data there are some other considerations as a solution architect how many batches you are going to configure in the system how many workflows will be configured how many alerts will be configured what is your arch archival strategy and which cleanup routines we are going to use so all these there is a blog from microsoft fast track team where all the standard cleanup routines are listed along with their uh, steps so i would highly recommend architects to go and check out the cleanup routines which microsoft has published yeah so that brings me towards the end of the discussion and i just want to summarize that keep these checklists held, uh, handy and uh, follow success by design principles because that's very important and they will help you to ease out your implementation pains if these principles are understood and applied your implementation journey will be quite smooth and your discussions with microsoft and customers will be more mature because you have the right documents in place stay in line with the latest product roadmap and microsoft publishes the roadmap for wave one and wave two if you find any major gap try to see if is microsoft working on something similar and if it is coming in the roadmap then it's worth waiting for those feature and the last thing i want to emphasize is don't reinvent the wheel to create these templates uh, i just want to show that microsoft has published some artifacts on github where you can actually go and do download all these templates so as a part of the uh, success by design artifacts microsoft has prepared all these templates which you can use as a jump starter pack and for example there is a solution blueprint template which has a sample business process catalog on how to define your business processes how you can capture your environment plan interfaces data migrations and data models so use these documents as a jump starter kit don't reinvent the whole wheel that will make your life much easy with that we can move to the q a window and thanks for uh, listening to me guys and i do wish you guys all the best for any implementation project you are doing and once again thanks dynamics con and the sponsors and organizers for giving us this opportunity thank you Hello everyone, uh, I am sure everyone is very excited for this DynamicsCon event and so am I. Thanks for watching the video and the session. I am available for any question and answers. Um, but while we are waiting for the questions, I would like to share the link of GitHub from where you can download all these document artifacts. So I have posted that in the chat window. Uh, also, I will be happy to answer your questions. Uh, uh, in future, if you can drop me a mail on my email address and contact information uh, shown in the introduction slide. I will also share the link of the uh, Success by Design implementation guide, which is published by Microsoft. And the link is aka.ms slash d365 implementation guide. So if you type this in your URL, you can download the in success by design guide and then you can read all these uh, implementation principles in detail there is also a fast track uh, published uh, documents on microsoft docs for which i have shared the link so these links are useful if you have to start building an understanding of the principles and how you can apply these during various phases of the project implementation I hope you all will enjoy the rest of the uh, DynamicsCon event and I am looking forward to a lot of exciting sessions which are lined up. I'm just waiting for a few more questions if they come. Also another thing I would like to highlight while I'm waiting for the, session, uh, for the questions is that Microsoft is working on the platform convergence features where finance and operations is coming closer to Dataverse and Power Platform. So there are upcoming features where uh, you can see that 
we can embed the user interface of two different dynamics applications within each other. Uh, their integration capabilities are becoming more smooth. Uh, the, the experience of uh, configuring dual write is becoming uh, more uh, clickable. Uh, like you can just do a one click in LCS and it deploys your dual write solutions in Dataverse. So keep an eye on all the platform convergence features which Microsoft is releasing because these will uh, also help you as a solution architect when you are doing discussions with your customers and if you are using multiple Dynamics 365 applications in your implementation. So I hope these tips will uh, help you during your implementation phase. Just checking a few more questions. Okay. All right. Um, okay, just a minute. I'm now able to see some questions. Uh, okay. So the recording will be available in another four weeks. Um, so there are if you faced errors uh, you might need to check the uh, log uh, but feel free to reach out to me um, with your specific questions any uh, pointers when using these templates one of the key thing is to keep an eye on the execution sequence because if you don't define the execution sequence in a proper way then your data export or import may get hampered so that is one of the key things. So when you use a standard data templates as your jump starter kit, you can modify them. So if you are extending any standard entity and if you are creating new data entities, which become part of that data project template, then you have to modify it. And at that point, you need to make sure that the execution sequence is correct. I have shared the link to the blog. Uh, I'll paste it in this chat window. Just give me a minute. Okay. So what I'm sharing here is the links for the uh, GitHub from where you can download the templates, the link for the implementation guide, and the link for the Microsoft Docs, which talks about the success by design principle. Just give me one more minute. Okay. Share the link. Okay, let me pick another question. Okay. So what is the link for the Microsoft blog for making data migration more effective and faster? So if you if you search with the name of Fast Track Architect uh, Stephen Copens, you will be able to find it. Uh, I'll search it and post it in the window. So question is data migration templates, they include everything, all tables. Most customers just use a small subset and another issue. Some tables are included in several templates. So if you will create duplicates, another issue. Okay, so I see you have uh, tried using it and probably might not have worked and, worked. and this is where you have to use it to identify if you want to use it as is or you want to tweak it. So if you want a small subset of data, you can remove data entities from there. If you are using cross company sharings, then you might need to create a separate data project to load such data so that you can um, do a cross company uh, sharing of these data. Yes, you have to accommodate these templates if you are using uh, multiple companies. Yes, correct. Uh, Zavika, these are just to kickstart your journey. So imagine if you have to, more than 2,500 data entities uh, out of the box, if you have to start uh, configuring from scratch, it will be a, a big work to do. So Rafal is asking, I have read somewhere, uh, but I think it was one of the latest uh, release wave description material that Power Platform will be integrated into LCS and possibly even take over some of its functionality. Uh, yes, so this is uh, what I was talking about. Uh, Microsoft platform convergence, where Microsofts want to simplify the experience for the end users and also the system administrators. So if you have 
an implementation where you are working on um, customer engagement and finance and operations and you are using dual right uh, i would say maybe one year back you have to install all these solutions manually but now it has already become a one click experience from lcs and going forward in future microsoft may bring this capability in power platform admin center also so we'll have to keep an eye how these features are getting evolved and then uh, yeah we have to align with those things but yes uh, all these things are coming that you will have CUD events in Dataverse, you will have business events in Dataverse, which means you can centralize Dataverse as the hub for business events. So for example, if you are using customer engagement to raise a sales order invoice, or you are using finance and operations to raise a sales order invoice, Dataverse should be able to talk to external applications and maybe uh, engage with your customers. So these are some big features where Microsoft is working. Uh, and a lot of energy and a lot of uh, private preview programs are being conducted by Microsoft. So do check out their uh, announcements and do stay in touch with them. Uh, I would recommend to join the Yammer Insider program where you can engage directly with the teams who are working on these, uh, uh, on these functionalities. Uh, so I have provided the link to the GitHub site. Uh, thank you guys for the feedback. Okay, all right, uh, so there is a question that we experienced issues when using data templates in workspace to move configurations and master data from sandbox to dev. The issues were too much, so we paused it. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you may face issues, <laughs> uh, but uh, it's more about how you structure the templates. Uh, the platform is quite mature and the most and is the recommended way to manage your configuration centrally. Uh, what I have seen is in most of the projects, uh, consultants end up in managing it in Excel, which is very painful. Uh, it takes time to mature these data migration project templates uh, to convert them into your configuration templates. Uh, it can be an iterative process. So. Uh, the tip is to start using them early on, have something ready to go. Uh, and if you face issues, you need to identify why that issue is coming. Uh, is the configuration changing or some setup in between your environments is not correct? And maybe for example, if you're using cross company in one, one environment and it's not enabled in another one, or maybe you have uh, logged uh, a legal entity and marked it as a consolidation company and you can't migrate some data. so. Uh, there can be multiple uh, reasons for these packages to fail when you try to load, uh, but uh, it is an iterative process. Can we please talk about how to speed up journals loading? It takes a lot of time for large import files. Uh, uh, it depends on what you are using. If you are using OData for large volume, it will be slow. Uh, so it's recommended to use DMF uh, APIs uh, or a recurring APIs if you are importing large files. And if you have more maturity in the data which is coming in, you can create a duplicate data entity of a standard uh, entity and try to uh, refactor the code which is written in data entity which you don't want to get executed uh, whenever your data is being pushed into the system. Uh, another thing to speed up journal uh, loading can be configuration of the DMF parameter screen where you can define the parallelism where system automatically creates multiple threads based on the bundling size. You can define that for your new entity if you create uh, a duplicate of a standard entity. So I hope that helps. Um, do you find most customer open to using LCS and DevOps? I tend to find they do not want to be bothered learning these tools uh it, it really depends on the customer but uh, we should highly recommend them to know this because it's actually their uh, their ip at the end and uh, they have to maintain it after go live uh, lcs is the portal to have a view of how many environments you have it is it is a critical portal which you can't just uh, ignore and uh, keep moving on but yeah uh, it definitely should be embraced by customers. DevOps is also a powerful platform because if you are using it properly, then 
you are managing your work items, you're managing your code repositories, you're managing your build pipelines, you're managing your R set test cases, you can see your test cases, execution results in DevOps. Then you can also do some uh, release automation where you want to automatically uh, you know, deploy the code packages to different environments. So uh, I have actually seen customers do embrace this tool, uh, but if there are some customers who are not liking it or who don't want to do it, uh, maybe try to spark a conversation and understand the reason for that. Um, yeah, hope that answers, Wendy. Uh, Dharan, has any caveats to use them? I'm not sure uh, any caveats to use what, um, not able to relate. Uh, so if you can post in a bit more detail, then let us know. Um, thanks, Molly. Do you recommend Task Recorder to create a training manual? Of course, yes, we should always use Task Recorder to create a training manuals. The reason is uh, you can also use this to feed into your R set test cases. So once you start using Task Recorder and once your users get familiar with it, it's always, uh, you know, it's, it's an idea where you can use your end users to start creating test cases for you. Uh, and you can also use this to onboard new employees when they join your company. So if you have created a task recording, you can always play back it as a guide. So if you play it back as a guide, it gives you a very guided experience that click here, select this, enter value in this column. So if you are onboarding new employees, for example, in your accounts payable department, they can be uh, quickly trained by using task guides to know how to run a payment process for a particular vendor. So definitely recommend it. Uh, task recorder is a great tool to use. Okay. Is there a way to use MS Word branded templates to export setups from Task Recorder like we used to do in 2012? Uh, I would not recommend that. Uh, I mean, you can create a Word document, but it should not be, uh, oh, sorry, maybe I misread it. Uh, export steps. Yes, you can use it to export steps like we used to do it in 2012, uh, but a task, task guide is more recommended tool to go. User manuals, yes, you can you create user manuals. And there is a nice uh, Google Chrome extension, which also captures your screenshots when you use task guide. So if you install that uh, and then you run your task recorder, um, the document which you get will also have uh, screenshots in it. Uh, is your step with its face is not relevant any longer at all? Uh, I would not say that sure step is also a methodology to do your implementations um, and success by design is a principle and that's the key to understand here that success by design is not a methodology whereas sure step was a methodology where you can say okay this is how i will do it so even success by design principles can be baked into your sure step methodology process so sure step is is relevant uh, most of the partners have their own way of working, uh, which could be their uh, unique selling points and unique way of implementations. But it, it's relevant uh, totally, uh, and it depends on the uh, customers and the project. Uh, is there any link for DevOps to migrate the solution for Power Platform Dev to Prod? For Power Platform, I believe you have to use uh, release pipelines uh, and uh, your release tasks in DevOps. There are links, there are people who, who do keep uh, posting sessions and videos around this. So I would recommend to watch that. Um, can Azure Data Lake measure as replacement of BYUD? If yes, is there any potential release date for it? Uh, yes, Ali Raza, I do slightly agree with that. Uh, Data Lake can be considered as a replacement for BYUD, but do keep an eye on Microsoft's official statements on that. Uh, potential release date, it has been uh, been getting delayed for some time now. So I would say to keep an eye on the Microsoft Docs and the Microsoft Cloud Blocks portal where you can keep an eye on the, uh, on the upcoming uh, release. Uh, thank you for the feedback, guys. Uh, can we switch off run business logic and insert update method or run business validations for loading customers, vendors? Uh, I would uh, I would say if you want to bypass these business logic, you need to test that your data is actually correct. Because the key here is not just to load the data quickly, 
uh, I think the key here is to load the data correctly, right? So if you you test by disabling these features and not only loading the data, you try to create a sales order, try to run a posting of an invoice, try to settle a transaction, because if even one or two fields get loaded incorrectly, it can impact your whole whole process going forward. So, uh, so test after changing these configurations and then yes, you can turn it off uh, if it if it is going fine after that. All right, guys, I think uh, if I have missed any questions, please drop me a mail at arg3030 at outlook.com. I'll type my uh, email address. I'll join the virtual party. And please do drop me an email if you want to connect with me. And I'm happy to uh, connect and answer your questions. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the show. And uh, take care. And stay safe.